sketch. I do not always work from sketches, just so you know. A little bit later. <coughs> uh, sometimes I steal unintentionally. I had no idea, but there is actually a whole tradition of black velvet devils on the toilet. I thought that the idea of doing the devil on the toilet would be a hilarious riff on Rodin. Um, oftentimes, I find myself getting very, very perfectionistic in my work. And once I've hit, I, I used this expression before, but I noticed that as a creative person, I go through three phases. One is sort of primitive, where I'm establishing the parameters of, of what I'm exploring. And then I develop a sort of upward momentum and thrust and it's very exciting and I really get going and I enter into a sort of um, uh, renaissance ma mature phase with it and then at some point it becomes decadent and more about exaggeration and uh, emotion and at some point there will be a phase of diminishing returns where I'm basically flogging a dead horse creatively desperately trying to get the last drop of fabulous excitement out of something that is basically not exciting anymore. So I did this piece when I had hit a point of diminishing returns with whatever. And actually the piece I think that sort of I peaked at was that one that I showed with Winston Churchill in the coffin of the little girl in the, in the coffin. And after that I felt like, you know, I, I couldn't top that basically. Not that I'm competitive or anything. but. Uh, so th in this piece, I basically gave myself an assignment to make sheer and utter garbage. And I have found that repeatedly in my life, I have to give myself the assignment to make trash because I get so overwhelmingly concerned. Like when I was a painter, I think what was preventing me from painting was the fact that I was terrified of the history of painting. It was, there was just too much. It was so... Um, serious and so profound and I became so self-conscious that I, I couldn't do anything. So that happens over and over again, unfortunately. Um, and the cure for me seems to be to say, okay, now is the time for garbage. This, on the other hand, was based on a billboard. This is the original sketch. And as you can see, I've put the uh, figure in the window next to the sketch because I want you to see that I do sometimes start with a sketch, but vast revision is a huge part of my process. That sketch was supposed to be of a basically an upside down crucifixion, and it was for an entirely different piece. But when I, I don't know what happened, but that was a real eureka moment. I, w I went into the studio, I saw this sketch of the crucified woman, and thought to put it at the bottom of the, this sketch, and it was uh, really a moment for me. I had to take a walk, I remember that. It was like, oh my god, I got, I got to take a walk. Um, because she looks like an anchor, right? So I was like, wow. But I didn't plan it. A little bit later. I got really interested in black and white at this point. I mean, there is some color, but it, there's a lot of black and white, too. Here's some details of those. I started to get very interested in making these sort of purpley blue people, pearly looking people. People have asked me a lot about the distortion of my figures as if it's in my control um, and that I would have some sort of brilliant insight into why I'm doing this. I once actually was in some sort of a, a presentation where they discussed with psychiatrists analyzing these people's artwork, including mine. And the psychiatrist said that they thought that my figures had the proportions of babies and that this was about, you know, my maternal urges, which um, was news to me because my maternal urges are entirely given over to cats. But maybe I've sublimated them into art. I don't know. But I will say it is not uncommon to make huge-headed people in the history of art or in the history of popular culture. I think in the uh, Middle Ages, people were um, much more interested in the head because that's the area of interest, basically. As I said earlier today, it's just really boring to paint thighs. But anyway, 
Um, I th actually, what related to the baby thing, my mother told me when I was little that someday I would stop playing with dolls. And I remember just thinking, no, I will never, ever, ever stop playing with dolls. And I wish she was alive so that I could show her my artwork and say, they're all the size of my beautiful Chrissy. They're, I'm playing with dolls and I will never stop. A little later, I make pieces in the shape of a keystone because I live in the keystone state. I don't know, I just like that shape. Um, <coughs> obsessive patterning is something I'm very interested in. I would say, um, as a militant ornamentalist, to me, the backgrounds arise concurrently with the figures. I would hate to think that they actually don't in terms of how I make them. I make the figures at a separate time than I make the backgrounds. But to me, the idea that because this is a narrative image, that like you would imagine this to have a story attached to it, like the girl walked into the room and then she laid her head on the table in a sad way. To me, she's always been there, she will always be there, she could not be anywhere else or in any other position or at any other time. This is the only way it can possibly be. The whole um, gestalt would have to be spontaneously generated as it is. To me, the narrative would be how I came to these design conclusions. And the, because I spend much more time on the backgrounds making them, they actually have a huge deal of importance to me I mean, they take forever. <laughs> Every artist has a set of rules that they feel their work must follow. And these rules are great until they no longer are great, and then you have to get rid of them and come up with new rules. But as far as I know, I have never repeated one of these kaleidoscope patterns. And I have never used a plain background and I never crop figures. I think I have object permanence issues um, because to me a cropped figure is something that has had horrible physical damage done to it. Like that is basically someone with their head chopped off and, it, and their elbow chopped off. It's just horrible looking to me. I do occasionally crop for uh, conceptual reasons, which I will get to later. It's a little bit later. All right, now the technical stuff. I get a lot of questions about technique. And uh, I was recently uh, sort of lumped in with this group called Glass Secessionism, which was sort of anxious to declare itself uh, independent of the idea of a glass artist who is obsessed with materials and technique. Uh, and they were declaring the primacy of concept to glass. Now to me, you cannot declare prima, uh, concept to have primacy unless you are going to do a mind-body split that is so violent and terrifying. I am absolutely influenced by the material and the process, and that is 50% of the experience, if not more. So I would say I, I had them remove my name from this group. It probably seemed really egotistical, but whatever. Um, so, a lot of the people who look at my work are struck by the subject matter or the design, but a lot of it has to do with the techniques. This is called Little Red Motherhood, and that is the middle part. For a long time, I was very obsessed with working glass in the following way. The glass itself has two layers of color on it. Imagine a cameo. So, on the, um, this piece here, right here, is red on clear flash glass. Flash glass is hand-blown glass that has this characteristic of a thin veneer of color over a base layer of another color, usually clear. And no, I do not blow the glass myself, so if you're disappointed, you can leave now. But it would take me forever. And this one is blue on clear, and this one is pink on clear. And what I am doing to create these images is I am removing the color and I remove it with sandblaster and a flexible shaft engraver and a two other types of engravers at this point, but that's neither here nor there. 
and also with hand files, diamond files, which is, as far as I know, I invented that technique because the diamond file is for an entirely different purpose, basically getting rid of sharp edges. Um, I, the black and the yellow are paint, and the paint fires on in a kiln. Um, the yellow actually stains the glass, which is the origin of the term stained glass. And for many years, I would work the glass so that it was like a color separation, that when you put it together, the layers, you would get this. And I want to stress that I did not do a color drawing ahead of time, nor did I know what it would look like. The only thing I have is experience, a lot of experience at this point, and um, the desire to be surprised. So that is how the image is got. And here, this is a very recent piece called Feral Child, and I will show you some of the area of the birds up here. That's what the plates look like when they're separated. The top is when they're just being started, and gradually I'm engraving more and more into the glass until it's really highly worked up. And there it has a, the pink layer as well, and the yellow has been, and the black has been painted on. And when you put it together, it looks like that. So it's three layers of glass, and each layer of glass has two layers. So it's six layers of glass. A little later, and a little later. I made a lot of windows. That's another thing. If you make a lot of pieces, you will not be freaked out when some of them aren't good. So how does one, de uh, or me, develop ideas into actual material objects? I find this process to be completely miraculous. Because this is not how it happens. <laughs> but I think that civilians often imagine this is how it happens. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pieces and go through it step by step. This is a ship on her shoulder. It started out um, when I was reading Juxtapose magazine, which used to show this art test, and I and have contemporary um, graffiti artists and underground culture artists draw one of the things for their magazine, and I drew the pirate. They didn't print it, but I drew the pirate. There's the pirate. Then I turned the pirate on his side and stuck a boat on his back. For the life of me, I can't tell you why I did that, but I do know that when I have a sketch of a figure, I will always turn it around and flip it and look at it in all directions. Then I turned it into a woman because I just do things like that. And that was basically how it came into being. What story you read into it is entirely up to you. The main thing I do when I make these images is I edit them for openness and interpretability. I really don't have a specific interpretation in mind. If I think I'm going in that direction, I will try to edit it to make it more open. Because I'm really wanting, um, I'm doing this for eternity. Does that sound grandiose? It probably does. This piece is, um, explicated on the right-hand side here. This is called Resurrectage, and this was basically the original source, which is this sort of sentimental print of two Victorian children mourning a dead rabbit. I made this cartoon of it. It's one of those sort of officially sanctified garbage ideas. Whoops, sorry. And um, I thought it was too glib. I, you know, the idea of an animal being killed on the highway is actually really horribly, horribly upsetting to me. I could not have done a dog or a cat in this image because I wouldn't have been able to even tolerate looking at it. So I turned it into a rabbit because I am just evil that way. Rabbits, I don't care about them as much as cats and dogs. Um, and so you can see the image gets progressively less silly, at least I hope it does. Um, and this piece, this is the finished piece on the lower right. I actually made the piece four times. This took like almost a year. And I was just in absolute agony trying to resolve this piece. I could not resolve it to my satisfaction. And one of the problems was that I kept on coming up with plans for it, which 
plans always lead to expectations, and expectations always lead to horrible, crushing disappointment. It's far better for me to proceed completely blind, because then I'm either pleasantly surprised or I'm just horrified. But I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to be horrified if I have plans. So I might as well not have plans. I remember the thing that um, helped me through this piece, believe it or not, was acupuncture. Because acupuncture makes me all kinds of hallucinating. Um, so, well, that's always nice, you know. This was a digital print I made of that image. And I tried very hard to reproduce this in stained glass. But there, the conditions are different, and it's foolish to try. And that's the final piece. Here's a piece I made twice. And here's a piece called You Are Here that I had a very hard time making. I made the figure three times, although in this case I had the sense to come up with some sort of a background and assemble them so they could be sold as studies rather than um, I have these boxes. Um, I, I had so many of these boxes that I basically put on Facebook that I was giving it all away. And uh, I didn't have any preconceptions about how this was going to turn out, but a lot of strangers came to my house and took away my scraps. And I've, I felt like they were basically hauling my garbage for me. But they were like, oh my god, thank you so much. And I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> and one of them like became someone's backsplash, and another one used it with children. And it, it became all kinds of things. It was really interesting. More later. Um, <clears throat> I do think sometimes, you know, I have an inspiration that would be classified as a verbal idea. I wanted to work with the idea of panic attacks and how god awful they are. And her, she's got in her heart a hand grenade that the pin is being pulled by a hummingbird, which is basically what it feels like to have a panic attack. Oh, all right, that's enough about that one. I thought I would include uh, in this lecture the three artists I most don't want to be confused with. Um, <laughs> my students uh, introduced me to Masa as an example of something they loved. And it was, uh, uh, God, I just think that's the worst painting ever made in the history of art, in case you're wondering. And <laughs> I truly loathe that painting. And I also, you know, I, I look at my work sometimes and I go like, am I being a little too airte? Because I can, I can feel a little bit of airte in me. And I like uh, goth stuff, but I don't want to be too goth. This piece, I'm just showing you this because it's one of my favorites, and I couldn't bear not to show it to you large. The outside panels, uh, it's based a little, I think, a little bit on um, Lars von Trier's movie Breaking the Waves, but I didn't realize that until after I was done. Most of my insight into my work happens after it's finished, believe it or not. Um, I wanted to work with this theme, which is sometimes called Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. If you Google octopus porn, you'll find lots of images based on this. Um, and a local note. Um, I wanted to make a cyclorama, having been to Gettysburg a few times and seen the cyclorama there. So the outside panels of this piece basically make the image into a cylinder, should you happen to bend it into one. This is at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, so you go there to try and bend it. At the same time, I was working on this piece. It's one of the very, very few pieces I ever did with an assistant. Um, I don't work with assistants because I work naked and I sing. And I think that's just really cruel. No, wait a minute. Um, no, my studio is very small, and I don't want to work with assistants. That's why I don't work with assistants. Anyway, <laughs> I had the assistant making those images of the bottle, because they're done with uh, photo uh, stencils. This was. Uh, this is my uh, crafts department faculty meeting agenda. I still doodle compulsively. I take the doodles and I put them into Photoshop documents so that I, um, whoops, so that I don't have to uh, look at all the visual noise around it. And in this case, basically, I just took those little creatures and stuck each one in a bottle. 
You know, I live in the town with the Munner Museum. <clears throat> I have a long abiding obsession with Andrew Wyeth's painting, Christina's World. And one day when I was sitting on my toilet, I had this vision. This vision. <laughs> I'm so glad I had a camera. Um, as a professional artist, I have to make work whether or not I'm inspired or not. So one day when I was completely uninspired, I decided to do a reinterpretation of Christina's world, and I drew this figure, which then became a digital print. It was, it was really huge, maybe not this huge, but it could have been because the document was like a terabyte when I was done with it. Um, and my intention when making digital prints is always to do something that is completely impossible to do in stained glass. 